Hey everybody, this is a video on the introduction to circular motion. So what is circular motion? Or oh, exactly uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion is when an object with mass undergoes a circular path whereby its velocity changes but the speed remains constant. That is, although the speed, that is the magnitude of velocity stays constant, the direction of the velocity changes as it goes around the circle. I've used the red arrows as vectors to illustrate the changes in directions for the velocity vector. In order for a object with mass to undergo such a motion, we need to have some sort of acceleration to cause the velocity vector to change in the direction that's shown. And the acceleration that we need will be perpendicular to the velocity vector. So for example, for the mass that's traveling at this point, as it's going to the left, we need an acceleration to change the direction of velocity so that it eventually changes in the direction shown. This acceleration that's required in circular motion is called the centripetal acceleration. The word centripetal means center seeking. The acceleration vector always points towards the center of the circle and as such it remains perpendicular to the velocity vector. So the centripetal acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circular motion and it remains perpendicular to the velocity vector. The equation for centripetal acceleration is the velocity squared v squared over r, which is the radius of the circular motion. This equation is useful because it will remind you that the magnitude of the acceleration is affected by two things, the object's velocity and the radius of circular motion. If the object is traveling faster, then the acceleration needed for circular motion will also be greater. If the radius of the circular motion is bigger, so that is if the circle is bigger itself, then the acceleration, that the centripetal acceleration, will be therefore smaller because the two variables here are inversely proportional. There's a couple of terms uh, we need to go through for uniform circular motion. The period of circular motion is the time taken for the object to complete one revolution. Now since the distance of one revolution is given by the circumference of the circle, that is 2 pi r, and if the object undergoes uniform circular motion with a constant speed, we can take the total circumference and divide it by that speed. This will give us a time taken, and that is the period, capital T. The frequency of circular motion is the number of revolutions completed in one second. And just like waves, we can calculate the frequency by taking the reciprocal of the period. So that is one over the period, and this is often in per second or hertz. In uniform circular motion, there are two types of velocities or speed. The very first one is what we call linear speed or tangential speed. This is referring to the red straight vector of velocity, and this linear velocity changes as the mass undergoes a uniform circular motion. And as we saw before, we can simply calculate the velocity by taking the circumference 2 pi r divided by the period that is the time taken for the object to complete one revolution. Now, we don't always need the entire circle or circumference circle and the period to calculate the velocity. We can take a short distance or arc of the circular motion and divide by time taken to complete that particular segment of the circle. And so this is just simply d divided by time. The other type of velocity or speed is the angular speed. And this is calculated by taking the angle that's completed by the object around the center and divided by the time taken to do so. So for an entire revolution, the angle is 2 pi in radians. So this is equivalent to 360 degrees. So we can take 2 pi, divide it by the same time, that is a period, and we can calculate the omega, which is the angular speed in radians per second. So the unit for omega, angular speed, is different to unusual velocity, which is in meters per second. Like the linear speed, we don't always need the whole revolution to calculate the omega. We can use a certain angle of a particular segment of a sector of the circle, taking that angle and divide by the time taken to complete that particular sector of the circle. So this is given by the formula, the change in theta divided by time to do so. Let's look at our question. So a thousand kilogram mass travels a circle of radius five meters and completes four revolutions in two seconds. Calculate the period, frequency, angular speed and linear speed and the centripetal acceleration acting on the mass. We can first calculate the frequency of the circular motion. So frequency is the number of revolutions completed in one second. So we can take four revolutions and divide it by two seconds. 
This gives us two revolutions per second. Okay, so this means the frequency is two revolutions per second. In every one second, the object completes two revolutions around the circle. Period is one over frequency. So this is one over two, which gives us 0 0.5 seconds. This number here represents that the object takes exactly half a second to complete one revolution. The angular speed, which is represented by the symbol omega, is given by 2 pi. So this is the total angle in radians of the entire circle divided by period to do so, so 0 0.5. And this gives us 4 pi radians per second. In contrast, the linear speed, which is given by the symbol v, is given by 2 pi r divided by the period. So this is 2 pi times by the radius, which is 5 meters, divided by the time, or the period, to do so, 0 0.5 again. And this gives us 20 pi meters per second. Lastly, the centripetal acceleration is given by the formula v squared over r. So we can take the linear velocity, 20 pi squared, divided by the radius, which is 5 meters. The acceleration here is 790 meters per second squared, and the direction for the acceleration will be towards the center of the circle. Remember that centripetal acceleration means it's a center-seeking acceleration. The direction will be always pointing towards the center of the circle. Now we've gone through the, the requirement for centripetal acceleration, it's important to think back to the module dynamics where we learnt about Newton's laws. Specifically in Newton's second law, we learnt that in order for an object with mass to have acceleration, there must be a net force exerted upon it. So this is a quick comparison between the type of forces and acceleration we've done so far. When the force is parallel to the velocity, it can either be in the same direction or in the opposite direction as the velocity vector. If the net force is in the right direction, which is the same as the velocity, that means the acceleration of the object with this velocity will be always to the right. And the result of this is that the velocity vector becomes longer. In other words, the velocity of the object increases in the same direction. In contrast, if the net force acting on the object is in the opposite direction but remains parallel, the resultant acceleration or deceleration becomes in the opposite direction. And as a result, the velocity vector of the object becomes smaller, therefore it decreases in speed. In order to have centripetal acceleration, we want to produce a net force in the same direction, towards the center of a circle. So imagine that this velocity vector is part of a circular path. If we can produce a net force in the same direction towards the center of the circle, it will help us produce a centripetal acceleration towards the same direction. And as a result, we can then change the direction of the velocity such that the object can undergo uniform circular motion. And unsurprisingly, the force that's required to produce the centripetal acceleration is called the centripetal force. We can derive the equation for centripetal force by using Newton's second law and the centripetal acceleration formula that we learned earlier. If we multiply mass of the object on both sides, we'll get the following expression. ma equals to mv squared over r. And using Newton's second law, ma, where a is a centripetal acceleration, would then be equal to the net force acting on the object, that is the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. Mass of the object times by the linear velocity of the object squared divided by the radius. It's quite important for you to see the similarity between the acceleration formula and the force formula for circular motion. You should be able to see that the difference between them is using Newton's second law. There are a few important things you should take away with centripetal forces. Centripetal force is a net force acting on the object that is perpendicular to the mass's linear velocity. So that's shown in this diagram here. And the reason why it's called centripetal force is again because the force is center-seeking. It is always pointing towards the center of the circle. And we need this force to allow any mass to undergo uniform circular motion. That is a circular path with a constant speed by changing velocity direction. While the velocity of the object changes in direction around the circle, it's important to keep in mind that in a uniform circular motion, the speed remains constant. So that, that is the magnitude of the velocity remains the same throughout the motion. It's important to use the centripetal force equation to understand how the magnitude of centripetal force required 
is affected by the three variables, the mass of the object, m, and the velocity of the object, v squared, as well as the radius of circular motion. If we double the mass, that is, if the mass gets twice as heavy, while its speed or velocity and the radius of circular motion remains constant, then what will happen to the centripetal force? Have a think about it, pause the video here. To do these questions, what we can do is replace the m with 2 because we are doubling it. And if the other variables remain constant, we can substitute a 1 into the equation. So 1 squared for velocity squared and 1 for the radius. And this gives something number 2. This means the centripetal force that's required to provide the same circular motion if the mass doubles will be twice as strong. That is, the magnitude is twice as big as before. What about if we double the speed and keep the mass and radius the same? Again, we can use the same strategy here. So centripetal force is equal to 1, mass is constant, but now we double the speed, so 2 squared, divided by 1, which is for the radius. And this gives us a number of 4, which means the magnitude of centripetal forces required will become 4 times as large as before in order to keep an object that has twice the speed in the same circular motion. What about for tripling speed? Well, same idea. So we can substitute 1 into the mass, 3 into the velocity squared, divided by 1 for the radius. And this gives us 9. So that tells us the centripetal force will be 9 times as great. Now let's look at the effect of changing radius. If we double the radius, we can replace the m and v both by 1, and the radius here by 2. And the resultant effect on the force is that this gives me a number of a half, which means the magnitude of the centripetal force should be half as strong as before, so half the value as before, in order to cause a circular motion that has twice the radius. And if we halve the radius, this will have the opposite effect, so 1 for both mass and velocity, divided by half in the denominator, and this gives us a number of 2. So the magnitude of centripetal force should be twice as large as before, if we want a circular motion with half the radius. So hopefully you can see by now that both mass and velocity, these two are directly proportional to the centripetal force. Whereas the relationship between the centripetal force and the radius is actually inversely proportional. So if we increase the radius, the centripetal force required will be going down. If we decrease the radius required, then the centripetal force will become greater. It's also to keep in mind that although mass and velocity will positively impact the magnitude of centripetal force, it's the v squared that is directly proportional to the centripetal force. Okay, let's take a look at another question. So a 500 kilogram mass travels in a circle of radius 2 meters and completes 10 revolutions in 2 seconds. Calculate the period, frequency, and centripetal force acting on the object. So again, we can calculate frequency first. 10 revolutions in 2 seconds. This is equivalent to 5 revolutions per second. Therefore, the period is 1 over the frequency, which is 1 over 5. So this is 0 0.2 second. So this means the object takes 0 0.2 seconds to complete one revolution. The centripetal force is given by the formula mv squared over r. We have the mass already, 500 kilograms, and we have the radius, 2 meters, although we are missing the velocity squared. We can find the velocity first by using v equals to 2 pi r, so that's the circumference of the circle, divided by the period. So it's 2 pi times by 5, divided by period, which is 0 0.2. And this gives us 157 meters per second. So I can use this number, put it into my equation for centripetal force to calculate the centripetal force. And we get quite a large number, 6,169 newtons. And again, this is towards the center of the circle because it's a center seeking force, a centripetal force. Now to wrap up the video, I want to leave you with a very important concept to think about. For a uniform circular motion to occur, we discussed that there must be a net force acting on the object that towards the center of the circle, and we call this force the centripetal force. However, this is where circular motion becomes very interesting. The centripetal force will be caused by a variety of different forces depending on where the uniform circular motion is taking place. So for example, in a hammer throw in the Olympics games, when the weights undergo circular motion, the force that's providing the centripetal force is tension. When the vehicle goes around a circular bend or turn on the road, 
the centripetal force that's causing the car to undergo a circular motion is the frictional force between the surfaces and the tires of the car. And the final example I've got for you here to think about is when a object or spaceship or satellite orbits around the Earth, it can also orbit in a circular motion. And in this case, the centripetal force that's causing the circular motion is provided by the gravitational force or the weight force of the satellites. We'll go through each individual example of circular motion in separate videos. This concludes the introduction to circular motion.